الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين برادر و سستر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to introduce to you an eminent scientist and a scholar of Quran Dr. Morris Bukail pronounced as Morris Bukai, am I right, doctor? <laughs> Doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, is a native of France. He is a medical doctor and his specialty is surgery. Sometime along his career, he became interested in the study of Quran and he studied Quran in French translation. And later, he also read Quran in English translation and he was pointed out the inadequacy of the translations. As a result, at age 50, he took upon learning the Arabic language and he became a learned scholar in Arabic and he found out the real inadequacy of the translations and problems. And being a scientist himself, he took upon himself to explain the biblical narratives and the Quran and science. And uh, he wrote his book in French back in 1971, I believe, which was later translated and published in 19 late 70s in English language. The book is The Bible, The Quran and Science. It's an excellent book. And then uh, he came across the problem of the uh, controversy between evolution and the uh, creation. And uh, he tackled that problem and he wrote the book, What is the Origin of Man? And both the books are here in paperback and uh, uh, some of the old version of this one will be available after the lecture outside and this in the original new version is available, will be available outside and those of you who would not have can order through your bookstore here we will have it available. Now he is writing a third book which is complete and ready for publication it's the medicine and the mummies of pharaohs and there you know the Musa al -Islam was born at one pharaoh and when he crossed the Red Sea there was another pharaoh who was drowned and he has done extensive research and uh, he came up with conclusions that there are two different pharaohs not the same one. Uh, I will not take any more time and you will know him through his lectures Dr. Maurice Bukhal. Mr. Sherman, I want to thank you very much for your kind introduction. It is my, my pleasure to be among you this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. There is no human work prior to modern times that contains statements which were equally in advance of the state of knowledge at the time they appeared and which might be compared to the Quran. There is perhaps no better illustration of the close links between Islam and science than the Prophet's hadith. Seek after science even in China, which is a veritable invitation to man to enrich his knowledge. More significant, if it is possible, is the famous hadith Midaidul Ulama Abdalou min Dami Shuada. The scholar's ink is more precious than the martyr's blood. It comes as no surprise, therefore, to learn that religion and science have always been considered to be twin sisters by Islam, and that today, at a time when science has taken such great strides, they still continue to be associated. And furthermore, certain scientific data are used 
for the better understanding of the Quranic text. What is more, in a century where, for many, scientific truth has dealt a death blow to religious belief, it is precisely the discoveries of science that, in an objective examination of the Islamic revelation, have highlighted the supernatural character of certain aspects of the revelation. When all is said and done, generally speaking, scientific knowledge would seem, in spite of what people may say, to be highly conducive to reflection on the existence of God. Once we begin to ask ourselves in an unbiased or unprejudiced way about the metaphysical lessons to be derived from some of today's knowledge, for example, our knowledge of the infinitely small or the problem of life, we indeed discover many reasons for thinking along these lines. When we think about the remarkable organization presiding over the birth and maintenance of life, it surely becomes clear that the likelihood of it being the result of chance gets less and less our, as our knowledge and progress in this field expand. To me, it would seem that the scientific progress made in understanding the fantastic complexity of higher beings provides strong arguments in favor of the opposite theory. In other words, the existence of an extraordinarily methodical organization presiding over the remarkable arrangement of the phenomena of life. In many parts of the book, the Quran leads in simple terms to this kind of general reflection, but it also contains infinitely more precise data which are directly related to facts discovered by modern science. These are what exercise a magnetic attraction for today's scientists. For many centuries, Man was unable to study them because he did not possess sufficient scientific means. It is only today that numerous verses of the Quran dealing with natural phenomena have become comprehensible. A reading of all the commentaries, however knowledgeable their authors may have been in their day, bears solemn witness to a total inability to grasp the meaning of such verses. It, I should even go so far as uh, to say that in the 20th century, with its compartmentalization of ever-increasing knowledge, it is not always easy for the average scientist to understand everything he reads in the Quran on such subjects without having recourse to specialize research. This means that to understand all such verses of the Quran, one is today required to have an absolutely encyclopedic knowledge, by which I mean one which embraces very many disciplines. The Quran is a religious book which has no scientific purpose. Whenever man is invited to reflect upon the works of creation and numerous natural phenomena, the obvious intention is to stress divine omnipotence. In these reflections, we find allusions to data connected with firmly established scientific knowledge. These findings clearly appeared only in modern times. When one compares religious teachings with material data, one must carefully take account of the meaning of the words of the Quranic text. This is a suggestive example in a verse of the Suratul Araf about the creation. 
inna abakumullahu allazi ghalaka samawati wal arda fi sittati ayamin the common translation is your lord is god who created the heavens and the earth in six days nevertheless we know that the arabic word ayam the usual translation of which is days appears in the quran with the meaning of very long periods of time examples are given in my book the bible the quran and science no equivalence exists with the precise meaning of the word in the bible where the days of the week are considered the seventh one being the sabbath when god is described in the bible has having rested the quran does not mention it at all the major notion to be derived from the quran concerning the creation is a concomitance in the celestial and terrestrial evolutions with the fundamental data about the existence of an initial unique gaseous mass whose elements all now at first fused together subsequently became separated these notions are expressed in the surah fusilla thumma istawa ila samai wa hiya duhanun then god turned to the heaven when it was a smoke and in the surah al anbiya أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَكْنَاهُمَا Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and earth were joined together, then we clothe them asunder. The separation process resulted in the formation of multiple worlds, a notion which crops up. A dozen times in the Quran, when it has formed the second verse in the Surah Al-Fatiha, "Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin," praise be to God, the Lord of the World. All this is in perfect agreement with modern ideas on the existence of a primary nebula and the process of secondary separation of the elements that had formed. the initial unique mass this separation resulted in the formation of galaxies and then when these divided of stars from which the planets were to be born all that is in perfect agreement with modern notions concerning the history of the universe moreover reference is made in the quran to an intermediary creation between the heavens and the earth as in surah al surah al furqan wa lakad alakna samawati wal arda wa ma bayna huma we have created the heaven the earth and what is between them this intermediary creation corresponds to the modern discoveries of bridges of matter which have been demonstrated as present outside organized astronomical systems or can we imagine that a man much more than a thousand years ago could have been the author of such reflections which proceed from a general concept of the universe when this concept was not formed until centuries after his death in the quran we find notions about the nature and the movement of celestial formations for example the sun and the moon which were previously defined in the bible as luminaries are distinguished in the quran by the use of different epithets light nur for the moon torch siraj for the sun Presently we know that the first is an inert body which reflects light the second is a celestial formation in a state of permanent combustion and a source of light and heat the word star 
Najm in the Quran is accompanied by another qualifying it which indicates that it burns and consumes itself as it pierces through the shadows of the night. It is the word Thaqib. The word Kaukab definitely seems to mean the planets which are celestial formations that reflect and do not produce light like the sun. Today we know that the celestial organization is balanced by the position of the stars in defined orbits and the interplay of gravitational forces related to their mass and speed of movement, each with its own motion. Orbit and own motion are the foundation of this balance. They are precisely what the Quran describes in the Surah Al-Anbiya. وَهُوَ الَّذِي غَلَكَ اللَّيْلَ وَالنَّارَ وَالشَّمْسَ وَالْكَمَرَ كُلٌ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ God is the one who created the night, the day, the sun and the moon. Each one is traveling in an orbit with its own motion. This movement is expressed by the verb sabaha, yasbahun, in the text. The primitive meaning of the word, I said, the primitive meaning of the word, carrying the, the idea of a motion which comes from any moving body, be it the movement of one leg as one runs or the action of swimming in water. The sequence of day and night is expressed in terms that today are highly significant from a scientific point of view by using the, the verb kawara, kawara second form. So the Surah Al-Zumar described the night describe the way the night winds or coils itself about the day, just as in the original meaning of the verb, a turban is wound around the head, a totally valid comparison. The evolution of the heavens and the notion of a settled place for the sun are also mentioned. They are in agreement with well-established modern ideas. More than that, the Quran seems to have alluded to the expansion of the universe. There is also the conquest of space. This has been undertaken thanks to remarkable technological progress and has resulted in man's journey to the moon. And this surely springs to mind when we read the Surat al khamar يا معشر الجن والإنس إن استطعتم من تنفذوا من أكثر السماوات والأرض فانفذوا لا تنفذون إلا بسلطان أو assemble of jinns and men if you can penetrate regions of the heavens and the earth then penetrate them you will not penetrate them save with the power this power comes from the Almighty the subject of the whole surah being an invitation to recognize God's beneficence to man. Let us now return to the earth, and among many statesmen, let us quote verses concerning the mountains. Modern geology has taught us the phenomenon of folding which formed the mountain ranges. The stability of mountains is linked to this phenomenon since the folds were to provide foundation for the reliefs that constituted the mountains. What do we find about them in, in the Surah Al-Naba? Alam Najalil Arda Mihadan Wal Jibala Autadan. Have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountain stakes? The stakes, Autad, in the Quran, which are put into the ground like those used to anchor a tent, are the deep foundations of geological folds. The same harmony with modern knowledge is noticed in the case 
of the numerous reflections in the Quran concerning the water cycle in nature. This is a topic which is very well known today, and the verses of the Quran referring to it seem to us to express ideas that are now totally self-evident. But if we consider the ideas prevalent at the time of the revelation, they appear to be clearly marked more than myths and philosophical speculation than by facts such as those observed and studied nowadays. Similarly, on other topics as well, such ancient and wrong notions never appeared in the Quran. Let us consider, for example, this verse in the Surah Al-Zumar. Alam tara anna Allah anzala min as-sama'i mahan fa salakahu ya nabiyya fi l'ardi thumma yukhriju bihi zahran mukhtalifan alwanuhu as that would not seem that God sent water down from the sky and led it through sources into the ground. Then he causes sown fields of different colors to grow. We must compare one of the aspects of the water cycle to which this verse alludes and other details about it given in the Quran with the ideas prevalent long ago. The first Korean description of the water cycle in nature dates back to the 16th century with Bernard Palissy. Prior to this, people talked about the theory whereby the waters of the oceans under the effect of winds were thrust to the interior of the continents. They then returned to the oceans via a great abyss, the Tartarus of Plato. In the 17th century, Descartes still believed in it, and even in the 19th century, there was talk of the theory according to which water was condensed in cool mountain caverns forming underground lakes that fed springs. Today we know that the infiltration of rainwater is responsible for this. But more than anything else, I, w I have been impressed at first by statements in the Quran dealing with living beings, the animal and vegetable kingdoms, especially with regard to the origin of life, the origin of man and reproduction. It is only since modern times that scientific progress has made the content of many such verses comprehensible to us. The ancient commentators presented them according to their apparent meaning, which was of the utmost importance, of course, since it evokes divine omnipotence. But they could not give a view of their real meaning. Lacking essential scientific knowledge, which is necessary to understand it. Even today, numerous translations and commentaries of the Quran, made by men with only a literary background, give a mistaken view of their real meaning. Only a scientist is able to give an explanation. The biological allusion in the Quran are highly significant, such is the case of a verse of the Surah Al-Anbiya, a part of which has already been quoted. Awalam yara al lazina kafaru ina samawati wal arda kana atarat kan fafatak nahuma wa jahalna min al-mahi kulla shayin hayin afala yuminu. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder? And we got every living thing out of the water. Will they then not believe? This is an affirmation of the modern idea that the origin of life is aquatic. Progress in botany at the time of the prophet was in no country advanced enough for it to be established as a rule that plants have 
both male and female parts. Nevertheless, we may read the following in the Surah Taha. Wa anzala min as samai mahan, fa hakraj nabi azwajan min nabatin shatta. God is the one who sent water down from the sky, and thereby we brought forth elements of couple of plants, elements of couples of plants, each separate from the other. In the Surah Al Rad, we read the following: Wa min kulli thamarati jahala fiha zaujaini ithnaini. Of all fruits, God placed on the earth two elements of a pair: zaujaini ithnaini. Verse thirty-six of the Surah Yasin clearly alludes to the existence of components of couples in plants as well as in the human beings whom the verse is referring to. Subhan al-lazi ghalak al-azwaja kullaha min ma tubitu l'ardu wa min anfusihim wa min ma la yalamun. Glory to him who created the components of couples of every kind or what the ground causes to grow on them, themselves, that is to say human beings, and of what they do not know. In the field of physiology, there is a verse which appears to be extremely significant. But to understand it, we have to know that chemical reactions occur in the intestine, and that substances extracted from food inside pass into the bloodstream, and that the bloodstream transports them to all the organs of the body, among which are the milk-producing mammary glands. That is precisely what is said in this verse of the Surah Al-Nahl. Wa inna lakum fil alami la ibratan nuskikum min ma fi butunihi min bayni farthin wa damin labanan ralisan sairan li sharibi. Verily in cattle there is a lesson for you. We give you to drink what is inside their bodies, coming from a conjunction between the contents of the intestine and the blood, a milk pure and pleasant for those who drink it. The Quranic revelation considerably enriched a man with data about himself, as we shall see. But its teachings have been clearly and completely understood only in modern times. As a medical doctor, particularly attracted to the natural sciences and physiology, I must confess that when I read the Quran, Excuse me. When I read the Quran in the original text for the first time, these data concerning man were those which impressed me the most. This is the reason why, as soon as I have finished my first study, the Bible, the Quran, and science, I seized a favorable opportunity to deliver a lecture before the French Academy of Medicine with a special reference. To human reproduction in the Quran. In order to carry out a valid comparison, one must remember that there existed a host of superstitions and myths about this topic in days of old, and emphasized the absence of any reference in the Quran to the mistaken ideas prevalent at the time of the communication to man. Let us mention that several verses evoke the complexity of the male fertilizing liquid and the fact that an infinitely small quantity of this liquid, expressed by Nutfa in the Quran, is required to ensure fertilization. This is also expressed by quintessence, if I may so translate the Arabic word sulala. The implantation of the egg in the female genital organ is perfectly described in several verses by the word alak, 
az in the sura al alak halakan insana min alak but my translation is the following one god fashioned the man from something which clings i do not think that there is any accurate translation of the word alak other than to use it once more its primitive meaning to speak here of an adherence or a blood clot is a mistake they are both derivative meanings quite out of place in this context the evolution of the embryo inside the maternal uterus is a subject of reflection whose simple words correspond exactly to fundamental stages in its growth as it appears in this verse of the surah al muminun far alakna lakata mudratan far alakna mudrata izaman fa kasaruna al hizama lahman we fashion the thing which clings into a shoot lump of flesh and we fashion the shoot flesh into bones and we clothe the, the bones with intact flesh thus an initial aspect of the embryo is evoked and thereafter the muscles covering the bones we know that the embryo passes through a stage when some of its parts are out of proportion with what is later to become the individual the sura al hajj seems to allude to this fa inna khalaqnakum min alakatin min mudratin mukhalakatin wa khayri mukhalakatin we fashion to you into something which clings into a lump of flesh in proportion and out of proportion in the sura al sajda there is a reference to the senses and the viscera wa ja'ala lakum al sama wal absara wal fidata god appointed for you the senses of hearing sight and the viscera all these quotations are in harmony with what was to be discovered many centuries later in view of the state of knowledge in prophet muhammad's day it is inconceivable that many of the statements in the quran which are connected with signs could have been the work of a man it is therefore perfectly legitimate not only to regard the quran as the expression of a revelation but also to award it a very special place on account of the guarantee of authenticity it provides and the presence in it of reflections which when studied today appear as a challenge to human explanation mr chairman ladies and gentlemen i want to thank you very much for your kind attention assalamu alaikum I believe in theory of evolution as profound by zoologist grass grassy if you do then it is not compatible with teachings of quran as discussed by sheikh abdul mabud in his article excuse me but i do not know the article of sheikh abdul mabud excuse me also that i cannot compare with the the cra the cra which is not uh, the cra of professor glasse himself alone not at all which is described in this book what is the origin of man i have written a small chapter about the creative evolution is what is now absolutely sure since now we know that the genome are responsible for the transformation of the functions of the cells consequently to transformation of the of tissues and consequently transformation of the entire 
a living being. There is no doubt about that. And recently, I had the pleasure to read a book which was written by a, a famous um, theolog Iranian theologian. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the name. Ayatollah, uh, excuse me, this is a book which is translated, which published in the United States at Berkeley. And this, this theologian, without knowing the least thing concerning science, by the examination of the Quranic, the examination of, of, of the Quranic text only, was able to come to the same theory of creative evolution. The, the, that is to say, the, the, the notion of a permanent creation for the living being through transformations of the genies and to obtain uh, a certain evolution that now the, the evolution is not absolutely, it's very well known, the evolution in the animal species in, in the animal kingdom is not absolutely continuous in the course of the time. Some species, uh, after a certain evolution, came to a halt. This is very well known with the uh, two examples which are famous. It is one of the famous fish, the Selacant, and the uh, more uh, something which more which is more common, it is the cockroach. The cockroach are the same one since two or three hundred millions of years. Evolution is not continuous in the animal kingdom. As to man, it is another thing, it is transformations of the uh, uh, created human species. I have explained that in detail in my book, What is the Origin of Man? And unfortunately, I think I have not the time in 15 or 20 minutes to give you all the necessary explanation. Uh, the second question is, what is the concept of time according to Quran? Oh, it's difficult to, to, to give you an answer about concept of time about the Quran. I should be very pleased to know what is exactly the concept of time according to the Quran? Well, some, some scientists suppose that in the Quran there is an allusion to relativity. For me, I doubt. Maybe I am wrong, and they are right. Could you please point out a few of the glaring in adequacies of the translation of the Quran that you came across? Yeah, no, uh, at, at first, I, I want to explain you that if I have suggested to revive several translations from the Quran, it is only about a very small number of verses. That is to say, in my book, The Bible, the Quran, and Sai, I have quoted in the complete uh, edition, not the edition that you have in the United States. I have written a, an index of the quotation from the Quran, and there is, there is bit, uh, a little bit more than uh, 150 and 50 verses only. The verses which, are, which might be connected with science, and not at all, not at all, the verses having only uh, uh, um, uh, an, an aim of religious teaching, not at all. Um, so that it is a very small number of verses concerning science, but they are of the utmost importance. For, and I want to give you an example. Huh? I see before me a, a translation which I know perfectly well by Marmaduke Pixel. 
Since a long time, I used for my studies of the Quran translation in French and also translation in English. I used Yusuf Ali, which is a wonderful translation. I used in English also Marmaduke Pixol. But I think that, that like you, I imagine, you all uh, think that it is an excellent translation. But concerning a small number of verses, I cannot accept the, the translation of Marmaduke Pixol. For example, wh when I said for the, the word Sabaha, Yasbahun, Kulun Fis, Fi Falakin Yasbahun. Bon. What, what is the translation of Marmaduke Pixol? I have controlled it before this lecture. Marmaduke Pixol, they, they float. Float. Because a derivative meaning of Sabaha is to swim in water. And they say float for, for the celestial formation. Maybe this is uh, poetic, but it is not the expression of the primitive meaning of the world, which is to move with what's own motion. For example, Marmaduke Pixel translates kinds instead of element of couples, kinds, as well, kinds. It is not, it, it's a bad translation from a scientific point of view. That, 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 that doesn't matter at all for the problem of the religious meaning of the Quran, you imagine. But it is only, only from the point of view of the possibility of connection between the Quranic teachings and modern science. And in the end, in the end, well, Clot, Ralakani Sanam il Alak, Marmaduke Pixos translate clot, but man never came from a blood clot, from a clot, not at all. This is a derivative meaning. And he used it because having not a scientific background, he was not in a position at all to imagine that this translation might be absolutely inaccurate. Excuse me, this is somewhat long, but I think it is necessary to tell you that. The next question is, what is the association between the Quran and science? It is, I have given the answer uh, before the question. <laughs> and also, this is also a, a repetition of the very first question, Darwin's theory of evolution. Alors, uh, but I have a lecture to be given about the origin of man. Alors, I, I, I shall explain that in detail about Darwin, that will be too long uh, uh, to explain you that now, uh, because my explanation w w will not be sufficient. Huh? It's better not to give explanation which might uh, my, uh, see, seem uh, to us, to, to you, to be somewhat light. Huh? <laughs> I prefer to, to give an explanation in depth about the theory of Darwin during the lecture to come in Please. According to Surah, which you mentioned that the origin of life is aquatic, how do we correlate this with Surah that Adam, peace be upon him, was elevated from, from clay yes. and yes. represent um, the beginning of human, of human, human uh, race, human being. race, yes. not in human species I prefer, not race, because I'm not a racist. <laughs> you are not, of course, that doesn't matter. Well, um, uh, yes, because the origin of light preceded in the animal kingdom the creation by God of the first man. That is to say, there is absolutely no contradiction between the beginning of life in animal kingdom and the creation of man by God. There is absolutely no, no, not, uh, in, not, a lack of compatibility. 
Not at all. He said at different stages of the, of the story of uh, living beings, man was created, uh, let us say, uh, after, uh, let us say, three, three billion years after the beginning of life on this earth. The creation of man is extremely recent. And the beginning of life on the earth is very, very old. Today, unfortunately, those who are the leaders in science are ignorant, indifferent, and even inimical towards the Quran. Those who believe in the Quran are mostly ignorant of science. How, in your opinion, this big gap should be filled up in the interest of humanity and the interest of the Quran? Certainly, this is an excellent question and this is an excellent reflection. Unfortunately, those who are the leaders in science are ignorant or indifferent. And, uh, and uh, those who believe in the Quran are mostly, mostly ignorant of science. I think it is too much. It is too much. Huh? Because you have very famous uh, Muslim scientists uh, one of them, uh, whom I know well, is Abdul Salam. Abdul Salam is a Nobel Prize winner in physics and is one of the most uh, com competent person in the world for the, the, uh, to describe, in order to describe the, the constitution of the matter in, in its depth. Alors, so that you, you are, uh, I think that you are too much severe about uh, the Muslim scientists. But I want to tell you that now in Europe, I know several scientists who, uh, who, uh, who with the discovery of molecular biology, the progress of molecular biology and the progress of genetics are now all seriously embarrassed when uh, one is, uh, uh, is evoking before them the problem of the existence of God. And I know that several ones in France particularly, which are now changing their ideas, and they said that science is able uh, to, uh, to lead uh, scientists to ponder over the existence of God or to believe in the existence of God. There is a progress now with, with the, the, the most recent discovery in the functions of the cell because I think it is the most important discovery in this century. You, you make the choice because I see you have a lot, a lot of papers. And it, uh, make your choice. <laughs> Uh, what is the scientific explanation of Barzakh, which Barzakh. is Barzakh, which is mentioned in the Quran? Barzakh. No, excuse me. Uh, it will be necessary for me not only to speak about the word, but to to know exactly the verse and to know the place of the verse in the Quran and to know what is before and what is after. It is very important to have an idea of the meaning of a word. Excuse me, I, but I, I am not a sheikh. <laughs> it, was, it was very political answer. Uh, it is a little away from the center. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> Can you comment on the existence of extra terrestrial life in the light of the Quran? <clears throat> I, I have not to comment because this is something to be discovered by human beings that is not yet discovered. I think it is mentioned in the Quran. Maybe I am wrong, but I think the, uh, 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 well, the verse is uh, 
sabas sabawatin wa min al-ardi mislawunna Lahu al-lazi jara la sabas samawatin wa min al-ardi mislawunna Isn't it that? Maybe It's okay? Thank you, thank you. But I mentioned that and I said in my text that there is something to be discovered in the future, but the Quran said that as far as I know. I hope that I am right. What is the exact meaning of Ar-Rijalu minan nasi khawamun? What Rijalu? Ar-Rijalu minan nasi khawamun. It is difficult once more to, to give you a precise comment about the world, but I, I cannot, I must uh, have a look at the Quranic text in a complete verse and uh, not at all to, I cannot give you a, a comment about a word or, or two or three words in the Quran if I do know perfectly well the Quranic text for this passage. Excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. We will see later on. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any verses of Quran which appear to have been refuted by modern science? No, 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 not one, not one. I made an inquir inquiry yeah? in depth, be sure. <laughs> Does the Quran mention Eve? Is it a Christian and non-Muslim belief? About Eve. Eve, but if you want to, to uh, the, the the wife of Adam, if you want to spell uh, to uh, call her Eve or uh, not to give the name of Eve, for me that doesn't matter. It is the same meaning in in the Bible and in in the Quran. Has any school or curriculum incorporated your twin sisters concept when teaching science? Has any school or curriculum incorporated your twin sisters concept? concept when teaching science? This is not my, my concept. This is an old concept of Islam. The religious and science are twin sisters. That does not come from me uh, at all. It is an old concept in the story of Islam. Okay. Could science prove the mm, clearance of moon? No. Cleavage of room. Moon. Shakal khamar. Cleavage of room, uh, moon. Cleavage. Cleavage of moon. Cleavage of moon. This is an, a, an event to come, where, when God uh, took the decision to to order it. Please comment an advantage of the lunar calendar over solar if any. I, I am not able to to make such comments about the, the lunar calendar over solar. Not not at all. Not at all. I think in the desert, it's very practical for men to have the, the moon as, as the base of a calendar. I imagine that. And maybe uh, in our country, there is no doubt the, the solar calendar is very useful, of course. But they are correspondent between the, the both ones, uh, which are very well known from the, uh, by the... Uh, astronomists, specialists in astronomy, which which line in the Holy Quran appeal to you the most? Not line, but many lines, particularly that is uh, where man, uh, living beings, man and human reproduction were concerned. I have said that in the, in the lecture. Please elaborate your interpretation of creation of you. Universe. From Quranic revelation, I, I do not understand it during your lecture. But I suppose you will have a copy of the lecture 
maybe you have a video cassette, you might make a text of it, isn't it? Huh? And you, you might have the text, I, I could not repeat during more than uh, 12, no, 10 minutes what I have said at the beginning when you were not attending at this time. Excuse me, but I am here for everybody one. Huh? Yeah. I think in this question, the ayah from Surah Tariq was referred to. Khulikha min ma'in dafiq yukhruju min bayni sulbi wa tarai. This verse has been translated as, He is created from gushing fluid that issued between lions and the ribs. It's a very complicated... Can you please elaborate it, uh, whether he refers to the male... male Yes, ducks. yes, yes, okay. It's an excellent question. But, uh, excuse me, it is too long to give you all the details which would be necessary for you to understand in depth this verse. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, the problem, the problem of the, the, the translation and comment of these verses is given to the, in uh, three, three pages and a half in the, this edition of my book. That will be too long to, to explain you what, what is main dafi yahujum in baini sulbi wal taraib, the precise meaning of sulb, precise meaning of taraib. It's the, you must read what, what I have written about that because it is somewhat complicated. I cannot uh, give you all the necessary explanation for you to understand it. It's, it's too much uh, important, uh, too much important details are necessary to, to understand uh, this, this precise meaning. But it's, uh, it's explained in my book. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, this was the uh, last question. Uh, I request Brother Amir Ali to inform here what are his uh, future lectures in Chicago. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Despite the fact that I have not a share. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Lecture Center A1. Lecture Center A1. The announcement they made initially, they said uh, 250 BSP, it has been changed to Lecture Center A1. The Chicago Circle Campus, the one which is located near the Loop, uh, on Harrison and Morgan, Harrison and Halstead. Uh, it's going to be 3.30 on Tuesday. And the topic is the narratives of uh, scriptures and the modern knowledge. Uh, on uh, same day, Tuesday evening, he is going to be giving a lecture on the origin of man, which is the topic of this book, and many of the questions related to the origin of man has appeared. Anyone who wants to know about the origin of man and what Dr. Maris Bukai has to say about it from his uh, studies of sciences and Quran, uh, please come to the Muslim Community Center of Chicago. And more importantly, bring in as many as non-Muslims, Americans as possible. We have advertised in the newspapers and extremely important. This is a very good opportunity for you to do the da'wah work, which is your responsibility to give the truth of Quran to other people. And you cannot get a more eminent scholar on Quran who sees and knows from the scientific point of view. And this is the time. And bring in as many Americans as you can. And we have made arrangements the way we did for Dr. Brother Ahmad Iddas lecture, the sitting arrangement for the Americans and uh, chairs and the rest of the area will be in the mosque for the Muslims. So please bring as many as you can. And also we'll be preparing 
a, a discussion question and answer tape, video tape, for later broadcasting and also will be available to you. It will be done privately, it's not a public affair. In addition, if Brother Aziz Khan agrees with me and he finds time, we will, give, we will do a lecture session on a very important topic, and that is the medicine and the mummies of pharaohs. Inshallah, Allah permitting, tomorrow we'll, we'll do that too. And all of that will be available, available through the Institute of Islamic Information and Education. And I'll take this opportunity a little bit to tell you about the Institute, that we are looking for the errors and misinformation in the textbooks, reference material, newspapers, wherever you find, please refer those things to me. I have brought some more flyers, I'll put it out. And Dr. Morris, because two books are available today, a few copies are available here, and uh, I will give it to your library, and you can order more copies, they will be available. And you will get the new version also as soon as they become available to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Maurice Mikhail, and thank you, brothers and sisters, that you, in spite of your busy schedule, all of you made an effort to come down here, though you were here in foundation this morning. And the, before we conclude our today's program, we will make dua, and inshallah the azan of Isha will be said at 9.15, and the jamaat will be at 9.30. So we will make dua and disperse. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين